season of new movies and theories about the assassination of JFK, this report will draw lightning. A doctor who was with President Kennedy when he died breaks nearly 30 years of silence. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was in the emergency room when President Kennedy was brought in. He examined the president, saw the wounds close hand, and based on that, Dr. Crenshaw challenges the results of the Warren Commission in an eyewitness account that is rich in detail and history and emotion. Dr. Crenshaw relives for Tom Jarrell the death of the president. On a sunny autumn afternoon in Dallas, President Kennedy, the First Lady, and Texas Governor John Connolly shared the presidential limousine. They passed large, friendly crowds, a good sign for a political outing. But as the entourage reached Dealey Plaza, passing below the six-story high school book depository building, suddenly lives were shattered. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from ABC Radio. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade today in downtown Dallas, Texas. Almost since the day the bullets rang out here in Dealey Plaza, conspiracy theories have emerged. They've come from many sources, always suggesting a plot to kill the president with more than one gunman involved. The latest conspiracy theory comes from a respected physician who refused to speak out until his professional career was largely behind him. We've seen from news photographs what happened here on November 22nd, 1963. His views come from a small emergency room where there were no cameras present. And until now, details have been scarce. Doctor, the president we know was shot, passing on the road in his motorcade down below. And the official version has Lee Harvey Oswald firing from behind. From what you say and what you're describing, he was shot from the front. That's correct. Meaning there had to be two gunmen. At least one and maybe two more. And you believe that? I'll always believe that because of the wounds that I observed at Parkland Hospital. Most important. Today, Dr. Charles Crenshaw is chairman of the surgery department at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth. But in the early 1960s, he was a third year resident at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, assigned to the trauma team where he had observed hundreds of gunshot wounds. Let's recall the scene that day. A bewildered First Lady, her clothing splattered with her husband's blood, stayed by his side as he entered the hospital. Among the surgical staff rushing into this medical chaos was Dr. Crenshaw, a junior member of the emergency room team who became an eyewitness to history. We ran into the emergency room and there was bedlam, total bedlam. People were running in, uh, people were crying. Did President Kennedy have uh, any vital signs when you reached the... He had room? barely a pulse. He had an, an agonal respiration. He had no blood pressure whatsoever. Did you see the tide, the, his life, in effect, running out? Yes. However, God love him, Malcolm Perry. He didn't want him to die as much as all of us. He started closed chest massage, pumping on his chest, trying to make him come back or resuscitate the heart. After the medical team had done their best, had worked as hard as they could and realized it was hopeless, was there time for tears among those who had put so much emotion and effort into this? Just before the cleanup really started, there was blood and bandages on the floor. His back brace was askewed on the wall. I think it got to me the most when I looked and saw the red roses of Mrs. Kennedy in the kick bucket there at the head of the table. And there his blood was still dripping on it. I was, felt helpless. I wished we could have done more. I mean, here we had trained all our lives and we'd lost the President of the United States and nobody wanted to be around. And Mrs. Kennedy came in. And she stopped and kissed his great toe. And then she went on the right side to hold his hand. And at that time, she took her ring off and put it on his small finger. And then he was wrapped in a sheet and we placed him in a coffin. But before we did, I looked at the wound again. I wanted to know and remember this the rest of my life. 
and the rest of my life I will always know he was shot from the front. This bullet to the head was beyond a doubt the fatal wound, which is clearly seen in the Zapruder home movie. However, the film is not as conclusive on the crucial issue of the bullet's direction. Did the shot come from behind Kennedy or from the front? Remember, the Warren Commission investigation concluded the shots came only from behind. Dr. Crenshaw says they're wrong. The bullet struck about where and passed about where? From here right. through. And taking out the... The back or the occipital part. The back of your head. This was gone, uh, in our view, and we, that's the reason we could see the cerebellum. Had the bullet come from the back, uh, what would have been the difference? It in the would one? have been much different. It would have gone a little more anterior and be a bigger blaster. Right. The second wound? The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening, very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. In a slow motion study of the film, President Kennedy grabs his throat with both hands, reacting, Crenshaw believes, as if he is shot from the front. At first, most of the doctors working on the president believed the small neck wound they observed to be an entry wound from the front. But a later autopsy from Bethesda Naval Hospital showed another previously undetected wound in the back, which the Dallas medical team had not found. This discovery made the Parkland doctors less certain in their initial conclusion that the shots came from the front. Dr. Charles Baxter, a senior member of the surgical team, believes it's impossible to tell the direction. Could it have been a bullet wound that came from the front? Oh, I think it could have, as well as from behind. Because the wound in the back and the wound in the front were essentially the same in appearance, both of them look like entry wounds. Uh, bullets, as they go in, begin to tumble, spin, and when they come out, they explode, so that the exit wound is always much larger and a lot more tissue damage. So what would appear clinically as an entry wound became question mark. Right. And that's the way it still stays today in my mind. Compounding the mystery is this photograph of the government's autopsy, showing a gaping wound in the president's neck. A tracheostomy incision was done at Parkland over the site of the bullet wound. Crenshaw says someone tampered with that wound after he last saw Kennedy's body, making it larger to resemble a bullet exit wound. Look, this is the size of the tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. Incision was made and then placed in. This large part, this flange, stays outside. So it was a small wound about the size of the, the instrument uh, that uh, you Right. Saw. An inch to an inch and a half maximum. This wound, and described in the Warren Commission, was almost three inches wide. Double the size. Then. Double. Is it possible that the doctor uh, working to put this in, what may have been already a bullet wound, uh, made the incision too large? Oh, no. No, Perry was an artist with the blade. He was one of the best trained technical surgeons. But it seems almost incomprehensible that a team of highly intelligent, highly trained doctors could be standing over the President of the United States and see wounds that you say came from the front, and yet the official government story is it came from the back, and wait this long to break the silence. Intimidation, fear, and career-mindedness. Those were the factors. Exactly. But again, you have to understand the time in 1963, the people that were with this country were telling you what to do, how to do it, and I think uh, the feeling was we went along to get along. Now semi-retired, Dr. Crenshaw has written a book breaking nearly 30 years of silence. Could the, what you call a conspiracy of silence have been out of plain old-fashioned patriotism among the doctors. No question about that. And Dr. Baxter had wanted no one to say anything because he was worried about commercialization. Well, I made the statement that any one of us uh, in the school or in the hospital that ever made a dime off of anything they said about the assassination, I would try to see that their medical career was ruined. You felt that strongly? Yes. 
I don't know how many emotions were in that statement, but I felt like it was uh, one that needed to be said. That's the reason I waited so long. I've waited until I felt I'm at the end of my career. I don't fear my peers, because I think they believe it too. This is the basement floor. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. Dr. Crenshaw's role in history was not over. Just two days later, another victim of the madness that gripped Dallas was wheeled through this hospital emergency entrance. Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused presidential assassin, was shot. And though mortally wounded, he too was brought here. Inside, there was another urgent rush of medics to the trauma room. Among them, again, the young Dr. Crenshaw. As the team was around him at the table, working, trying to save his life, you were called away. What was that about? The nurse came and tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I would take the phone call. And I picked up the phone, and it was like thunder, like God was talking. He said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. I said, yes, sir. And he said, how is the accused assassin doing? I said, well, he's critical, but right now he is holding his own. He then said, I want you to take a message to the operating surgeon and have a deathbed statement from Oswald. Oswald died on the table without saying a word. Could LBJ have made the call? The answer is yes. 2020 has obtained copies of White House logs from November 24, 1963. LBJ was in Washington attending church when Oswald was shot at 1221 Eastern Time. And at 1245 p.m., the same time Oswald was in surgery in Dallas, LBJ was first told he had been shot by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Moments later, LBJ, according to historian William Manchester, said to Robert Kennedy, quote, we've got to do something. We've got to get involved. President Johnson then had 15 minutes to make a call to Dallas before going outside to be with Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy for the procession to the rotunda, where the late President Kennedy would be lying in state. However, there is no official record of this phone call. What could it all mean? If LBJ were on the line to Dr. Crenshaw, demanding a deathbed confession, it means the new president was moving quickly to wrap up the case along government lines. How much of that was in the Warren Commission information? None. None at uh, all? I never um, talked to the Warren Commission. Uh, no one knew ever that uh, Lyndon Johnson called Parkland. Today, at the School Book Depository Museum, among the exhibits, is a display of a few sketches of the Kennedy autopsy, along with the official explanation that the wounds were from bullets fired only from the rear. What was your reaction when you saw the results, uh, photographs and the sketches from Bethesda, the autopsy done there? I was, it was beyond disbelief for me. I could not believe that a real pathologist would put out something this poorly. Was this the same man you saw as far as uh, John Kennedy, the same body that you observed? Not from the pictures that I saw. And I put him in the coffin. So you say their report in effect is a fraud? I say that it's uh, wrongly done. And the way it was done, maybe they were directed to do it that way. Tom, how does his story compare with that of other doctors who were in that room when the president died? Hugh, most of the doctors there immediately after his death uh, said they thought the gunshots came from the front. But when they got later autopsy information, they changed their mind and either said no, they agreed with the Warren Commission or they weren't sure of the direction. Did you get the feeling that Dr. Crenshaw was waiting rather impatiently all these years for the time to come when he could come forward? I got the feeling that Dr. Crenshaw is a very angry man, that he feels he's had very valuable information which has been withheld for a long period of time. He still carries anger over the way the police, the Secret Service, and the FBI treated the medical staff with guns drawn and sort of took over the situation there. So I think he's glad to vent this. Yesterday I talked to Richard Mosk, who uh, was a young commission staffer at that time on the Warren Commission, and he's very firm in, in his saying that... The, he and other members of the commission really believe they did everything they could and all the answers are in the report. Well, perhaps so, but maybe they closed the report too early. To have not gotten to someone like Crenshaw and put his views in, for example, is a failing. Uh, also, there seemed to have been a failing in a number of other areas as far as information that uh, basically just has been surfacing that's not in the report. 
What about files that are still under wraps? Of course, Congress is moving to open those, but the important thing is they're opening the files, not reopening the entire case for further investigation. It will be limited to just what's already known, so Crenshaw's information still wouldn't get in. This mystery's been going on a long time and probably will a long time uh, to come. Thank you, Tom.